donc on va commencer cette matinée consacrée aux neurosciences euh, et on a la, la grande chance de commencer avec Judy Les. Judy Les est professeure de neurologie. Elle euh, dirige le National Corps of Neuroethics à l'Université de British Columbia à Vancouver. C'est une des pionnières et des leaders mondiaux sur la réflexion dans le, sur les avancées des neurosciences dans le domaine de l'éthique. Elle a développé toute une équipe de recherche qui est maintenant euh, riche d'une vingtaine de personnes euh, qui travaillent sur des questions allant du diagnostic précoce de la maladie d'Alzheimer jusqu'à la question de l'application des tests génétiques pour les maladies neurologiques. Elle va nous faire une présentation. Encore une fois, il y aura une contradiction et c'est François et Singer euh, généticien euh, marseillais qui euh, portera euh, la répartie, le rebond, euh, un premier aspect de contradiction, et après, la controverse. Oui, mesdames et messieurs, collègues, c'est vraiment un euh, honneur et un plaisir d'être ici avec vous ce matin euh, pour cette réunion, de, une réunion importante du comité éthique de INSERM. Un euh, grand merci au professeur Dr Hervé Schneves, Dr. François Lévy, François Hirsch, uh, Emmanuel Hirsch, vraiment, je suis uh, privilégiée d'être ici avec vous et parler pendant les prochaines 30 minutes uh, sur des découvertes fortuites en biomédecine. Uh, J'exprime mieux en anglais qu'en français, alors je vais parler en anglais, mais peut-être on va discuter, uh, prendre un petit débat en, en français après, ou un peu franglais, peut-être avec moi. Um, mais aussi, je reviens bref, uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues in Canada. Uh, I have a wonderful team of 20 plus students and uh, researchers with me in Canada. Uh, all our participants, as well as those who um, generously fund us to do the work that we do. So what's our framework for thinking about incidental findings, they découvert fortuité in biomedicine? And it really is, we fall to some principles. We find them very convenient. Uh, they are, of course, beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy and justice. We add to this framework to really think about how biomedical science can be implemented for maximum public good and social benefit. We add to this what we believe are important principles of culture and context. So this will be the journey for the next little bit. What I'd like to do is think about with you about the return of unexpected findings in clinical medicine and research. And I'm going to divide uh, clinical medicine for you into really the practice of uh, medicine as well as genomic medicine and focus on uh, imaging research for the brain as our second model. And I may use the words incidental findings, unexpected findings, secondary, uh, off-target, they're really quite interchangeable in our context today. And they may be anticipated or not. This sounds a bit paradoxical for something that is fundamentally unexpected. But given the movement in our biomedicine now, we know that we can expect almost always some form of incidental finding, whether it's in the brain or in genetics. So we think of them uh, a bit, perhaps more as a lexicon, as off-target. And I think we've moved to that lexicon than anything. So we'll talk about genetic testing, we'll talk about brain imaging. And the thesis that I'd like to put forward for you this morning is the following, is that in clinical medicine, that is in healthcare, knowing, that is the right to know, to receive information, expected or not, is a feature of the patient-physician relationship, that is, the therapeutic relationship in clinical practice. In genomic medicine, I'd like to argue this morning, and I hope that you will debate with me, that opting to not know, that is, to not receive information about a genetic status is a human right, right? It is a right to not know. And in research imaging, the option to not know should not be an option. So let me just 
point out a little bit on this schematic that I made for you, what my thesis is. We put clinical medicine here in the middle as a little bit of a, with a depiction of the handshake of shared decision making between the patient and the physician. In genomic medicine, the right to not know is great. And in research, at least in brain imaging as our case example this morning, I believe the right to not know is small. So here are fundamental ethics challenges mapped onto what a three-dimensional space a bit inspired by the great neurophilosopher Patricia Churchland. And let's look at it regardless of what our context is. It is on the x-axis, voila. What is the incidence of a finding? How likely are we to have something that we didn't expect? Low to high. And similarly, how significant is it in terms of the well-being of the person in whom this finding or anomaly is discovered? On the y-axis here in this three-dimensional space, we have the consideration of the duty of care. I could argue that someone like me with only a PhD has a low duty of care towards the health welfare of a participant in whom I take into my laboratory, for example, and on whom I, I might do a brain imaging study with my colleagues, whereas the duty of care for Professor Schneves is far greater in his role as a physician scientist. And so here we have the y-axis. On the z-axis here, I've mapped privacy, and that is the right to not know and the right to know. And here on our scale, which is sort of a universal depiction of ethics, we have Pandora and her box and opening the box with all things coming out. And we happen to have a brain with uh, and a, a serious uh, vascular anomaly that I'll speak about more in a moment. So there have been many scholarly, scholarly milestones in this discourse about incidental findings over the years, perhaps starting 15 years ago. They've been taking place both separately from brain imaging and genetics and also combined. And let me just show you a few. In 1999, we had some discussions at the top of the slide from the National Bioethics Commission under President Clinton, then President Clinton in the United States, and by Katzman et al at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And then we're in a series of workshops uh, and meetings uh, led by those of us at independent universities, along with the NIH and Canada's NIH, like your INSERM. And what have these discussions looked like? They've been based both on empirical research and deliberative consultations. And they've considered, as I've shown you, incidents and significance all the way through vulnerable populations, special considerations for vulnerable populations, and non-empirical investigations, deliberative consultations along the lines of how actionable are results, whose responsibility is it to take care of them, and what is the receptivity of the public and research participants to them. And in just shown here on the lines that connect the two bars, is how the discourse has evolved over time, combining both brain imaging and genetics. Perhaps one of the most significant uh, discourses on this topic came out in December 2013 by President Obama's, US President Obama's Ethics Commission on the anticipation and communication of incidental findings. We were gratified as a group of researchers and scholars who've been working in this space for many years that their overarching recommendations really embraced what we had come to through our work. Um, and they involved the five that you see on this, on this slide, that is the imperative to inform persons about the possibility of a finding, to engage in evidence-based practice, that more empirical research is needed, all stakeholders must be part of the conversation, and that justice and fairness and health inequities must be addressed. Perhaps newly and still uncharted territories, what I show here on the bottom of the slide on the right, is how incidental findings are being managed in the direct-to-consumer space. This is in the open marketplace for-profit, whether they're being uh, sold among uh, for-profit Im imaging tests or genetics tests. So let me go on to our journey now, and this is, we're gonna talk about clinical medicine incidental findings, and I'm going to try to see if the video will work, and if not, I will narrate it, so it will not work. So let me just tell you this quick story, and I 
cannot possibly be Alan Alda for you, but he made um, a beautiful TV series, and you, oh, you can't even see it. Um, the, the story is simply that there's a healthy looking soldier who comes in from the front lines and from the war in Korea. He comes in with his friend who has been injured and he's prepared to give blood to save his fallen friend. And as the physicians on the front lines in the MASH unit under the tents, under the, the threat of, uh, of, of war, uh, they look under the microscope at his blood and they see in fact that he has a, a high cell count that's indicative of leukemia. And so they discuss, should they disclose to this young man on the front lines his leukemia, his certain, uh, certain death uh, coming soon, and who should tell him and how. And so this, this story really brings us in a passionate way, far more passionate than I've told it, on what professional and ethical principles are, are around disclosing incidental findings. Um, in clinical medicine, and they really fall on the disclosure with action. That is, you have a finding that clearly has a medical indication. You, as physicians, are obligated to disclose it and pursue uh, treatment as it's available. In some case, there may be disclosure with no action. In English, we call this watchful waiting. There may be a finding. It has an uncertain actionability, so we wait. We wait to make further tests in six months, we wait. And in some cases, the duty is not to disclose. Um, and, and this is, again, at the discretion of the treating physician. So it's a bit of precaution and caution combined. And so what are the building blocks to decision making in clinical medicine in, with respect to these kinds of findings? Actionability. Can this finding, can there be an action on the finding? What is the probability that the finding will manifest into a health threat? When might that health threat begin? Tomorrow, in two weeks, in 40 years? In the case of Alzheimer's disease, for example, with now some of our biomarker capabilities? How fast will there be decline? What is the availability to treat the disorder should a person be require it, and what is the burden on the healthcare system? All of these are reasonable building blocks to decision making. So now let me go on to where we, the problematic becomes far more dimensional, multidimensional, and complicated. And there's no better case, I think, than the case of genomic medicine. And the case example I want to give you is that of the recommendations in uh, one, about, about one year ago from the American College of Medical Genetics. Uh, the working group of that college recommended that for uh, whole exome and genomic sequencing for a primary finding, they recommended that all physicians are required and laboratories required to search secondarily for 56 additional genes for cancer and cardiovascular disease and adverse drug effects. So what does this look like? Imagine this hypothetical. We have a lady whose name is Greta. This is completely made up. She learned that when she was, uh, she was adopted and uh, her, m her mother had Huntington's disease and she wants to start a family now with her husband. She seeks genetic counseling. Under these new recommendations, she would not only be required to receive the results of the Huntington's test, she would be required to receive the results obligatorily of 56 other genetic tests. So here we made this up. So she would also receive the test for the BRCA gene, the breast cancer gene, Lynch syndrome. These would be positive and here would be some negative ones. So um, this was really problematic and then we made a big fuss in the United States and Canada about this um, because it seemed to strip patients of their autonomy to, to decide whether they want to know or no. There was no opportunity for the patient to decline unwanted information other than to decline to have the test from the beginning, which seems to be an abrogation of the duty of, of care. Um, in, 20, in April of 2014, and this is an example of where your work at INSERM and all of you here today can really make a difference if you have your voices heard. The position of the college was softened to allow the opt out at the time of sample send. So that is, a patient could be asked whether they wish 
to have the 56 additional genes tested or not. Once, if that was not, if that opt-out option was not given, then the obligation was to receive all back. But at least there was a lever placed at the beginning so that someone could opt out of having all of the 56. So what are the benefits, let's say, in this context of uh, having all these genes, these, test, these genes tested? Well, there certainly is the ben potential benefit of healthcare. The strength of the association for certain gene abnormalities creates some standards for reporting and analysis. It would appear to promote decision making. And in fact, it might mitigate preventable harm if in fact, uh, the gene genetic findings are those for actionable diseases as the 56 were chosen. Um, there are considerable risks. Um, one is that although patients would be required to consent um, and have genetic counseling for the target gene, there will be no consent per se or genetic counseling for the additional 56. Whereas if they were to test it for one of the other 56, they would receive genetic counseling for that. So it seems to be a little bit of a liability-driven uh, recommendation that clearly is a, an abrupt change to the principles of autonomy. And also importantly, these recommendations apply to children, not only to adults. And for us uh, in North America, this is really an abrogation of the Association of Pediatric Recommendations where you don't test a child uh, for, uh, for you, you don't make genetic testing for children unless there is a direct health implication for the child. But as I say, this position has been softened in a way that was very gratifying to all of us. But it's also important to think about now the escalation of testing in our healthcare system against a background where we're trying to pull back from other kinds of tests. Uh, testing for prostate cancer, unnecessary or uh, in free of reducing the frequency of mammograms and so forth. So we have these tensions now that genomic medicine is bringing us increasing testing, increasing results, increasing costs, potentially increasing anxiety against this balance of reducing certain tents, um, certain tents in other aspects of our healthcare system. So there's an ongoing conversation and debate around these issues. In some ways, these recommendations are sort of a return to paternalism, where autonomy and choice is being reduced, and this consumerism is going up. But I think overall what we've seen in this example is that there really may be um, a new kind, a new domain uh, for a new kind of healthcare professional, a little bit like Professor Schneves has been speaking about, intermediate people who are able to be the translators in our genomic era. Um, as, as we uh, increase our ability and capabilities to test and understand those results, um, healthcare professionals are being bombarded with information we don't know what some of this information means today, and it may well mean something tomorrow. And there really may be a space for a new kind of person in this conversation. So I'm going to go on now and make a shift for you as a comparator in the case of research imaging. And I'm going to give you another story. So we talked about the soldier in Korea. We talked about Greta and her interest in testing for Huntington's disease. And now let me tell you about Sarah. Sarah was a medical student at Stanford University when I was a professor there. She's six weeks into the program as a medical student, and she enthusiastically enrolls in an MRI study of uh, one of my PhD students, also a medical student. And he, my, the experimenter, notices an anomaly in Sarah's brain, in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. There's no institutional protocol in place, and of course, everybody expected that very brilliant Sarah would have a completely normal looking brain. What should this young investigator do? So what I'd like to do is just focus on the top of this slide, which is when we enter participants into our imaging research, we obtain scans just of structure and we notice something unusual there. What might those unusual findings look like? Well, they might look like a hemangioma as shown here, a vascular malformation as shown here, 
the angioma as shown here, we're not so interested in these things where we have colds and they, they right. we're interested in important findings here in the brain. So what's the frequency of these anomalies in the brain that we can now, now we know we can expect, although they are still unexpected. We know that about in one in one in um, five people have something unusual in the brain. So if I were to count 100 people in this room, every five of you has something unusual in your brain. I'm included in the count. Um, I have this, all of us in this room, probably one to 2% have actually a clinically significant undetected anomaly in the brain. It's not a terribly small number, um, but it is interesting because it does dissociate by age. So we know that in older people, this, this, I should make this older. I made this slide 10 years ago. Um, in older people, um, they're, they freak, the occurrence of anomalies in the brain is actually quite high, almost 50%. Unusual changes, but that are age appropriate. Where it is really important is where you have anomalies in the brain in young people. There, the frequency is really at a fraction of a percent, but those findings typically are very serious and require immediate medical attention. We know that there are gender differences. We've done some mathematical modeling of different ways uh, to think about whether it's important to do full clinical examination on potential participants or to not do that. And we learned through our modeling, and I'll just draw your attention to the bottom of this slide here, that in women of any age in whom there is a history of aneurysm in the family, it is, more, it is cost effective to do a full clinical neurological examination before enrolling them in a study than to enroll them in the study and then find something of clinical significance that has to be followed up. Um, and we don't have this in men, for example. So there are some important uh, gender effects that we have to think about in the brain, at least as it pertains to aneurysms. And we have other work to do in other models and other disease models. What else have we learned in our studies of incidental findings in the brain? Well, we've learned through uh, with studies of participants who were in an experiment. We investigated with them six months after the experiment, and we asked them, if we found something in your brain, would you want to know? Would you want to be informed? And would you seek evaluation? And we graded that along what we would call a scale of actionability from benign, so a benign cyst requires no intervention, to a life-threatening emergency. And remarkably, you see here in yellow the overwhelming response, positive response, to wanting to know regardless of the scale of actionability or significance of the finding. And even here in this box, where a participant would want to seek some type of further evaluation, even if he or she were disclosed that there was something in the brain of, uh, of certainty, but yet benign. So we are talking about some fundamental issues in brain imaging. Here I list some of them. And here the graph just shows you the increasing number of brain imaging experiments that we're doing now just with MRI alone, and this pattern continues off the scale. So we're talking about potentially tens, if not hundreds of thousands of participants around the world in whom we're doing these experiments and whom we have to think about the potential for these kinds of findings and how we want to deal with them. Given how fundamental these issues are, we have been working very hard over the years to provide some advice, like your ethics committee at INSERM, on how researchers should handle these kinds of findings. And by consensus, we have agreed, and these are with our Canadian American colleagues, that in research imaging studies, it is the obligation of the researcher to put a plan in place for how these findings will be managed, for that plan to be shared with the ethics review committee, and for that plan to be shared with the participant. There we had consensus. We also had, um, and we, so this is, we had consensus here. Also along the main bars here, here we have some divergence. And we allowed for some flexibility 
in how researchers could handle these findings, both to manage them and disclose how they would be managed, as well as to disclose that they would not be managed, although this was really a minority opinion, and this is why I have this in sort of a shaded box. Interestingly, and this comes to my thesis of this morning, at the time, we also allowed for the right for the subject to decline to be informed. And this was a clause where, we, where an investigator would tell a subject, we may find something, do you want to know or not? And the subject would have a right to say, no, I don't want to know. And I'll come back to this in a moment, if you would just keep it in your mind. But right now, just to show you that the path diverges here with many different ways of flexibility that privileges the interests and the rights of the investigator in the institution over the participant. So that is an, an investigator can decide whether in his or her protocol all scans would be reviewed, only some would be reviewed if something is detected, and many other options in how they are handled. So lots of ways to proceed. And in fact, what we learned through our further investigation and this will be interesting for me to see as you go on with your own deliberations and recommendations. When you want to offer flexibility because you want to um, encourage the autonomy of the people for whom you're giving recommendations, whether that is good or bad, we in fact found that our flexibility led to enormous inefficiency. And I'm not going to go on about what those inefficiencies were, but we learned from our investigators in North America a tremendous frustration with the number of options that they had that also led to many layers of review uh, in the ethics review and so forth. And what, in fact, they've asked us for is harmonized guidance. So now we've made the case that managing incidental findings is important, and now our investigators are actually asking for guidance that is far more prescriptive than it ever was before. So we've penetrated with our ethics discourse the importance of ethics, the importance of just thinking about the autonomy of the participant, the duty of the researcher, the liability of the institution, and now our investigators, in any case, wish for us to just tell them what to do. And one of the things we've told them, or we've suggested to do, is that we eliminate altogether the opt-out clause for the participant. And the reason for that is that in the case, in that one to two percent case, that there is a clinically significant finding and a participant has signed on the consent not wanting to know, the investigator is really in a Cassandra-like bind. He or she has a finding, a medical finding, that has the potential to be treated, but a legal document, sort of a bit of a contract that says the person wants to know and it is actually the duty of the researcher to abrogate the contract and disclose for the benefit, to privilege the health benefit of the participant, um, that information, in which case the opt-out clause really has, has no, no longer value. So we work on this harmonized guidance. So I, what I'd like to do is um, summarize and rationale my, uh, provide the rationale for my thesis and I'm not sure I am where I am with my time. So if I can go, encore cinq minutes, huit minutes, trois minutes, okay, okay. So here's my central thesis. My thesis was that in clinical medicine, disclosure of information is the, for the patient is really a function of the partnership between the physician and the patient. In genomic medicine, there is a huge right to not know, given the complexities of where we are in genomic medicine today, and in research, at least in imaging research, the rights of the researcher really have to be privileged, and the reason is to privilege the scientific integrity and efficiency of the research enterprise through transparency. And so in my last moment, I want to just share with you where there are uncertainties in my argument. And they are only, at this point, in research. And one is in communities um, for whom Western methods of informed consent don't apply. I work a great deal with indigenous populations in Canada, and their data, whether it's genetic or brain imaging information, 
are owned by the community. Consent to participate in research is given by the community first, is given by the tribal chief. Um, and so how these discussions and disclosures occur where there are multiple layers of consent that go beyond the individual are important questions we have to think about, whether we're in Canada, in the United States, in France, elsewhere. Um, there are, of course, issues of data that are archived. Today, we might have a finding, genetic or imaging, that is not actionable. That is, we don't think it has any treatment potential. We don't think it's significant. And we find in two years from now or five years from now that we have data on a person for whom a new cure for a disease, an undisclosed disease, exists. What is our obligation to recontact those people, potentially still within the research envelope or outside it when the study is done, the funding is done? What is our obligation to recontact those individuals? What is our obligation when we put our data into big biobanks? I put my data into a big biobank. Right, this is me, let's say. This is the biobank. I have no protocol for disclosing incidental findings. And Professor Levy comes and he uses my data for excellent purposes, but his protocol is to disclose and he actually discovers something. How do we return, do we return those results to participants? And whose responsibility is it to do that? And um, let me just say we have a lot of information about the function of the brain through marvelous studies of electricity, um, as well as oxygen flow. What we don't know is anything right now about how anomalies in oxygenation um, will affect, uh, will have a place in incidental findings. And here you might expect a nice experiment of how people appreciate and how their brains activate in response to indigenous flowers of France. But let's say our stimuli have uh, implications for social behavior or criminal justice. And here we have somebody, a young individual in an experiment in whom these images are shown and the activations to these, the brain activations to these images are different from 19 other people and may have implications for aggression, sociopathy, pedophilia. How will we deal with those findings? We do not have answers to those questions right now. And then we have the issue of combined technologies. We spoke about genetics. We spoke about imaging. When we put them together, the story will become very complicated. And it will become especially complicated when we put incidental findings into the story. Because we may have convergent results. And we may have results in one uh, technology where there is an incidental finding and in another where there isn't. And how we manage that, again, is completely unknown. So let me just conclude. Um, here's my thesis again. I've told you three different stories that all involve incidental findings, and I've shared with you some of the challenges of uncertainty in research. And I think we have to think today, as Professor Schneewe said, we have to think today about the future, not just the cherry on top Later, later on when we have vast new quantities of genomic and brainomic data, we have new capabilities with emerging and significant benefit, we have an increasing burden of the unexpected unknown, and today is the time to think about these things, to think about them in partnership, and to think about them as we negotiate the understanding of genes and the self and the mind and the brain, and through the kinds of international collaborations that bring us here together this morning. Grand merci. <laughs>